This is the brand new specialized Epic World Cup. The shock's in the top tube here, but there's no brain back here. Now in this video, we're gonna be going to the technical details behind this very lightweight and very fast race bike. We'll be talking about what we like about it, what we don't like about it, and we'll be asking the question, is this the best cross country bike on the market right now? So the Specialized Epic World Cup is a brand new model for 2023. The Specialized says it sits somewhere in between a hardtail and a traditional full suspension bike, and that makes it ideal for short track and XCO racing. It features a sleek, full carbon frame with a single pivot suspension design. The shock sits in a hollowed out pocket in the top tube, where it's driven by the world's tiniest swing link. This delivers just 75 mil of rear travel, and that's paired to 110 mil travel fork up front. Now the big news with the Epic World Cup is the lack of any brain damper for the rear shock. In its place is a new shock that's called the Sid Lux World Cup Integrated Design. And this is a result of a collaboration between Specialized and Rock Shocks. It is based on a regular Sid Lux shock, though it features a narrower body which helps to maintain a narrow profile for the frame's top tube. It is considerably longer though, and that provides more room for a larger volume air spring. Unlike a traditional air shock, however, there is no transfer port between the positive and the negative chambers. You add pressure to the positive chamber in the normal way, but there's no equalizing process required. Instead, you'll find this brass bleed valve on the outside of the shock body. Pushing this valve will allow you to introduce ambient air pressure into the negative chamber, which allows you to tune the negative spring independently from the positive spring. The Specialized refers to this as the gulp setting. Now, how much of a gulp the negative chamber takes depends on whether you press the bleed valve with the shock fully extended, fully compressed, or somewhere in between. This does offer an infinite range of adjustability, though to help simplify things, Specialized is referring to three main settings when it comes to setting up the rear shock. First, you've got the firm setting, which is where you press the bleed valve with the shock fully extended. At the recommended pressure, you should end up with zero sag, and this is designed to provide the firmest and most hardtail-like feel. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got the active setting. Now this is where you let all of the pressure out of the shock, compress it fully, then press the bleed button with the shock fully bottomed out. Then pump it back up to the recommended pressure, and you should have around 10% sag, which is designed to deliver the plushest performance. Between these two extremes, you've got the medium setting. Now here you'll need to compress the shock halfway through its stroke before pressing the bleed button. Then pump it back up to the recommended pressure and you should end up with around 5% sag, which is designed to provide a balance between comfort and efficiency. Now what's particularly interesting about the Epic World Cup is the fact that it's designed to be run with no sag in that firm setting. There are very few full suspension bikes that are designed to be run that way and there's a very good reason for that. With no sag and minimal pressure in the negative chamber, there's a very pronounced nose to the air spring curve which requires significant force to overcome. This reduces initial sensitivity, which is something that most suspension designers are trying to avoid. But in Specialized case, they've harnessed this nose to create a pedaling platform, which ends up providing a similar function to the inertia valve in the brain damper. It's actually quite clever, and as we'll touch on in a bit, it certainly works on the trail. While the Epic World Cup may be conservative on rear travel, it's quite progressive when it comes to the geometry. Compared to the regular Epic, the head angle is a full degree slacker at 66.5 degrees. The bottom bracket also sits 10 millimeters lower with a 58 millimeter BB drop. Reach is 440 millimeters on our medium sized test bike, and the seat angle comes in at 74.5 degrees, which is actually a degree slacker than the regular Epic. This boils down to the dynamic ride height of the Epic World Cup, which sits a lot higher in its travel due to the reduced sag. This means that when you're actually riding the bike, the fit is pretty similar to the regular Epic. There will be two models in the Specialized Epic World Cup lineup to begin with. There is of course a top-end S-Works model which comes with an eye-watering price tag of nearly 19 grand. The bike that I've been testing is the Epic World Cup Pro which comes in at just $13,900. This bike features a Fact 11M carbon frame and the proprietary Sid Lux Ultimate Shock. Up front is a custom RockShox Sid SL with 110mm travel and an updated brain damper. There's a SRAM XO transmission and level silver brakes, 
a Roval control carbon wheel set and 2.35 inch specialized tires with a fast track on the front and a Renegade on the back. Confirmed weight for our specialized Epic World Cup test bike is 10.32 kilos. And as usual, that's weighed without pedals and with the tires set up tubeless. Now it's worth pointing out here that the S-Works model, which uses FACT 12M carbon fiber, is claimed to be one of the lightest full suspension frames on the market at just 1,765 grams for a painted frame with shock, hardware, and the rear through axle. Now, if you're keen to see more frame and component weights, there's a heap more info in the full review over at flowmountainbike.com. There's also more detail about sizing and how we set up the fork and shock on this bike. So if you're keen to check it out, make sure you click the link in the video description below. Out on the trail, it's the incredible efficiency that defines the Epic World Cup. Set up in that firm position, this is the most efficient full suspension bike I have ever ridden. It feels pretty much locked out and it provides the kind of snappy pedaling performance you'd expect from a hardtail. This can be a little bit jarring to begin with since there's no negative travel like you get with a conventional full suspension bike. There's no real off the top sensitivity and the air springs nose means that the shock remains quite firm over smaller rocks and roots, especially at lower riding speeds. Once you hit something hard enough to break through that threshold, however, the suspension is surprisingly smooth and effective. I found this transition to be more seamless than the brain damper on the regular Epic, which suffers from a distinctive clunk every time the inertia valve opens. There is no such feedback here though, and thanks to the implementation of larger top out and bottom out bumpers, the shock manages itself quite well at either end of the stroke. Specialized says it's actually fine to bottom out the shock once or twice during a ride. And whenever I did hit full travel, it was a pretty quiet and controlled affair. Now, what I particularly love about the Epic World Cup is how much its character changes when modifying the shock setup. In the active setting, the rear end is noticeably more sensitive across smaller rubble. And if you flip the fork's brain damper to the lighter setting, traction and comfort increases all round. Now, I certainly wouldn't describe it as being plush, but it is still plenty effective when you're charging across rocky and technical XC trails. The mid-stroke is particularly active through the chunder and the sufficient progression to avoid the shock from blowing through its travel. The result is that it encourages you to ride hard and fast in order to get the most out of it. Clever suspension tech to one side, it's perhaps Perhaps the geometry and the handling that's impressed me most about the Epic World Cup. Despite being a near 10 kilo featherweight, the slack head angle affords terrific stability on the descents. The stable suspension means it's well balanced dynamically too, with none of the fore aft pitching that you can get from squishier bikes. This makes it surprisingly planted and relatively forgiving if you muck up your line choice, and it meant I was less nervous about not having a dropper post. That being said, handling is still very quick on tight single track. The short chain stays and low hanging bottom bracket encourage you to slice corners with vigor, and there is excellent lateral rigidity through the chassis to make the most of it. The tiny link and beefy shock minimize wag through the rear end, and while this lateral stiffness is never noticeable in terms of discomfort, it is apparent in the responsive handling. The brain fork also contributes to the responsive steering by resisting dive on smoother trails. It sits up in its travel through high speed berms, and combined with the slack head angle, there is very little risk of the front wheel tucking under even if you overcook it. Now while the suspension is very effective on the Epic World Cup, it doesn't offer the floaty comfort of plusher and longer travel bikes like the Scott Spark, the Merida 96 or the Giant Anthem. I noticed more feedback on this bike on longer trail rides, particularly towards the end as I was getting tired. Of course, it's important to remember that the Epic World Cup isn't trying to be the cushiest bike out there. This is a dedicated race machine that's specifically designed for short track and XCO events up to 90 minutes long, where comfort is less of a priority. For longer format marathon racing, multi-day events, and even recreational cross-country riding, I'd recommend looking towards the 120 mil travel Epic Evo instead. Now we'll point out that there are some avenues to explore to increase the versatility of this bike. While the shock comes from the factory without any volume spaces, there's room to fit up to three inside the air can to increase bottom out support. While I didn't need any with the stock setup, I'd be curious to add a couple of spaces and run sag around 20 to 25% to see if I could get a plusher ride quality out of the back end. I'd also love to add a dropper post and I'd be interested in trying it out with a 120 mil fork since the frame is rated for it. As for downsides, well, some will lament the arrival of headset cable routing on a specialized mountain bike. It does appear to be pretty well designed though. And the fact that only a single brake hose passes through the upper bearing means it's less of a big deal. Now, while the brain equipped fork is relatively well proven, there's still a 
question mark over the proprietary rear shock, which has yet to meet its ultimate test in the mass market. Thankfully, it does share a number of spare parts with the regular Sidlock shock, and we're told that damper and air sleeve servicing is quite similar. It's also worth pointing out that it's far less complex compared to the brain shock on the regular Epic. Furthermore, Specialized is claiming that the new shock is actually stiffer than a conventional shock. This is due to a huge Teflon support bushing in the middle, which has been made possible by the longer air can. It's claimed that there's less flex and binding during compression, and that should result in smoother sliding and less wear over time. Or at least, that's the theory anyway. Now, if you're curious to know how the Epic World Cup compares to some of the best cross-country bikes on the market, you'll find a load more info in the full review over at flowmountainbike.com. In there, we've got a detailed comparison with the Trek Supercaliber, and we also discuss what the Epic World Cup means for the regular Epic and the Epic Evo. If you're keen to check it out, make sure you click that link in the video description below. As for our verdict on the new specialized Epic World Cup, well, this bike isn't just lighter, simpler, and smoother than the brain-equipped Epic. It's also considerably more tunable. Set up the shock in the firm setting and it offers snappy hardtail like pedaling performance that is ideal for short track racing. Set it up in the active setting and you've got more grip and control for tackling longer and more technical courses. Despite the new shock offering a more seamless feel compared to the brain damper, this is still very much a race focused bike. You really need to push it hard and fast to get the best out of it and that does make it less suited to all round riding compared to the Spark, the Anthem and the Epic Evo. If you're after plushness and comfort, you will be better off looking at those options. In contrast, the Epic World Cup has been designed to combine the responsiveness of a hardtail with the big hit control of a full suspension bike, and in that regard, it does a marvelous job. It certainly isn't cheap, but if you value the clean cockpit, the sleek frame design, and the automated pedaling platform, the Epic World Cup is one of, if not the most efficient full suspension bikes currently on the market. Now, if you've got any questions for us about the Epic World Cup, make sure you drop those into the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you guys next time. Tooroo.